Oh, back up. There should be another one besides that one. Oh, maybe not. Um, there we go. Uh, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Paul Talley, uh, and I am the executive director of Wilderness Trek, uh, a program that your teens come on every two years. Um, we have two things we, we try to do at Wilderness Trek, and that's make disciples and train leaders. Uh, it's very important to us that we are giving people the tools they need to grow spiritually. Uh, I'm from Texas. Let me tell you a bit about myself. I have a, a wife and two boys. My wife is right here, Jane. We've been married 26 years, um, and uh, I, know, I, I know I'm only 28, so it doesn't, it doesn't look. The gray in my beard gives me away. Um, and we've got two boys uh, right behind us here in the picture. You can see Jackson on the right is actually the oldest. He's a freshman at Abilene Christian University. And then the six foot five guy on his side is his little brother, um, which goes over really well, named Luke. Um, and this is actually not the most recent photo of them. I was going to show the most recent photo of them, but they're wearing University of Texas shirts. And I really didn't want to get into an argument about which is the true UT and which color of orange is better. So I decided to use a little bit older photo right there. Um, let me tell you something else about me that you don't know. So uh, I'm an avid cyclist, and I have been since about um, 19, well, early 1980s. Uh, I, when my parents got me my first bicycle, uh, I got into competitive racing and riding. And then about 1990, my dad bought me a mountain bike. And that has been just a lifelong love affair um, with bicycles and all things bikes. I love to bike tour. I love to travel by bike. I love to ride bicycles. And um, they've just been a really big point of joy in my life and in my walk, actually, my spiritual walk, which is really interesting because something happened this year um, that was really traumatic for me. So Memorial Day of this year, I, I was up at our base camp in Santa Fe, Colorado. I mean, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, I was, I had a really stressful day. There was the largest forest fire in New Mexico state history had broken out. And it was not only burning lots of the territory we operate our programs in, it was knocking on the door of my family's homestead uh, my grandfather built a, a house in, in the 70, early 70s in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and it has been passed down generation to generation and is now um, my responsibility to maintain and keep. And I helped my grandfather build this place, and the forest fire was coming to the front door, literally. And so being a little stressed, I did what most people would do. I decided, you know what, maybe I should just go for a ride and go work out and I'll be much more relaxed when I get done. And while out riding my mountain bike by myself in the mountains of New Mexico, I actually had a wreck um, and found myself entangled into a situation that was near fatal. Um, I, when the dust settled, I discovered that I broke my shoulder, I broke my arm, um, I did what they called was zippering my ribs, which is my arm got pushed into my ribs and they immediately all broke off of the sternum and the spine. And so three of my ribs were floating and were what was called fractured and displaced. The other three ribs on this side are what's called flailed, which is when if you ever break a matchstick and it doesn't break clean, it breaks like that. Um, my ribs flailed out and broke like that that immediately punctured my lung and collapsed my lung and now you can see in this photo here I now have five plates and 47 screws that have rebuilt this side of my chest and here's what that does um, obviously I got to stay in the hospital for a nice long stay uh, and I got to stay in bed a lot this year uh, but when you have that kind of metal in your chest, you have what's called a flailed chest. And a flailed chest simply means that your rhythm of breathing is now interrupted. So when we all breathe from the first breath we've ever taken, our lungs expand and inflate on the same level, both sides at the same time. And this affects not only how they come out and in, but how they go up and how I get air and how I breathe. So from the most basic way I can say it is, is the most basic function of my life has been severely interrupted. I've had to learn how to breathe. I've had to learn how to cough. I've had to learn how to clear my lungs. 
I've had to learn how to do all kinds of things this year that I never thought I would have to learn how to do. In the most measurable way you can say it, I am a broken man, and the very rhythm of my life is now interrupted. But let me ask you a question for a second. Are you any different? Hopefully you don't have as much hardware and titanium in you as I do. But couldn't all of us say that we are broken and we are living in an environment where the rhythm of our life is severely interrupted? You know, one of the things that was interesting about this forest fire is that as I watched it burning away and closer and closer to our homestead, And as I worried about the ramifications for our ministry and what we'd be able to do and and how we would survive, I thought a lot about how life seems to give us times of chaos and times of order. And if you were here earlier when we talked during Bible class, we talked about how does chaos and order coexist in our life? How in the world do we get to a point where chaos and order can coexist in our faith. Here's the interesting thing about the forest fire. Our homestead survived, really from a a combination of reasons, but the fire burned to the front door, it went over, and then it burned from the back door on. But what's interesting about the forest fire is, is as I tour the area and as I look at all the destruction and as I look at all of our neighbors' homes that were burned down completely, I see not only chaos, but I see order. I see that there will be things that will happen moving forward that will actually be good and healthy. So, for instance, some of the land where timber had just grown uncontrollably for hundreds of years that hadn't been cleared, that hadn't been thinned, that it hadn't really had an opportunity to be healthy, now burned in a way that as it starts to regrow will be much healthier. So fire actually has this ability to cleanse. One of the things that's interesting to me is that we as a, as a human society, we understand nature's role of introducing chaos. We can go to the beach and we can understand that if a hurricane comes, that's just what nature does. And we don't think twice about it. We understand the value of a forest fire. Anybody who's ever tried to clear some timber or clear an old fence line understands the value of this, this destructive being. But when we get into our faith, we all of a sudden lose any objectivity about the value of chaos and order coexisting. So I said this this weekend, and I'll say it again. Imagine going to the beach in Florida. You go to the white sandy beach, and it's nice. It's 80 degrees. It's sunny. You're having fun. And you turn to the person next to you, and you say, man, what a great day. And they say, well, you should have been here last week. There was a hurricane. None of us would step back and say, what? In Florida, there was a hurricane? Who would have thought? How does that ever happen? We shrug our shoulders and we say, of course there was a hurricane. That's how nature works. You take the good with the bad. But what do we do when chaos is infused into our own lives? We act like it's out of place. We act like it doesn't belong, like it's something we need to wash off. We did something wrong because all of a sudden there's chaos in our life. If you don't believe me, Just check how you feel when someone drops by your house unexpected. You often are worried about the chaos they're going to see, not thinking naturally about what it is. So the truth is, is that we sometimes prefer order to chaos. We prefer our life to be orderly. We prefer for everything to work as it should. But the problem is life doesn't always work as it should, does it? We all have grief. We all have stress. We all have trauma in our lives. We all have things that happen. People die. People get divorced. We lose jobs. We lose friends. Businesses go under. Churches go under. And we all carry with us two types of trauma 
and grief and suffering. The first type, the first type is what I just call self-imposed. All of us, if you've lived long enough, you have some grief in your life that when you look really closely at it, it was probably your fault. Quite often it plays out in our schedule. We have grief about how we overschedule things. We have grief about how we try to do too much. We have grief about how we say too, yes to too many things. We try to take on too many things. That's self-imposed grief. Grief that really is by our own hands. And sometimes it gets even worse than that. Sometimes grief comes because we're the ones that we're responsible for a broken relationship. Or we're the ones that said the thing that, that hurt someone's feelings. Or we're the ones that did something. That's self-imposed grief. The other is more of a trauma. The other is grief that is thrust upon us. Grief that we didn't ask for. Maybe someone died. Maybe the job that you would work so hard to get just disappears and you're out of work. Maybe a friend or a spouse or someone close to you just doesn't want to be close to you anymore. And whether it's self-imposed or thrust upon us, the result is the same. It feels like chaos. And it feels out of place. And it feels like we've got to get it fixed as soon as possible to get back to where we need to be. You see, because there's pain that comes from what we experience... And then there's trauma, but both of them mixed together for us to feel chaotic. Like the rhythm of our life is interrupted. Like we just can't get on the right footing, like everything's just off. And the most natural question in the world for us to ask is, where is God right now? Where is God in our trauma and in our grief? Where is God when things are just going wrong? And I'm going to tell you today, and I'm going to explain this in a minute, that a better question to ask is not where is God, but what does God want to show me? What does God have for me to experience right now? And this new question should view God a little bit differently. You see, because it's our views of God that quite often stand in our way when we are going through trauma or grief. This new question, how does God want to use this? What does God want to teach me? Does not view God as some tyrant, some guy throwing lightning bolts down at us, but instead views God as, some, as a cosmic recycler. Views God as wanting to use our experiences for something new views God as wanting to make all things new and views God as wanting to create in us something new no matter what happens. You see, but we often want to be mad. When something happens, we want to be mad about it. And trust me, I've been there. I was leading a ministry through an incredibly hard time and I did exactly what any mental health professional would tell you to do. I went to go work out to clear my head and to pray. And as I laid in bed for the next eight weeks, it was an easy question to answer. That was an easy question to ask. Where is God and why would God have wanted this? Because it's easy to think we're on the team. Like we're on the inside, right? Right? God wouldn't do this to an insider. God wouldn't do something like this to us. So we often just get mad at God. You know, what's really interesting to me is, is I've had several friends go through traumatic things recently. And as I've talked with them, I've seen how all of them have handled them differently. How all of us have taken different paths. But one of the things that's really interesting to me is in all my years of ministry and in all the times I've worked with people with trauma, I've seen very few people who turn against God, who angrily just view God as I'm going against you now. Instead, what tends to happen in churches is we start treating God like a divorced spouse. Part of my past, someone I have to interact with occasionally, but not really someone that's involved in my daily life right now. I recently went to lunch with one of my really good friends who's going through a very messy divorce. And as I talked with him, I just asked, where are you spiritually? Where is God right now to you? And he laughed and goes, 
I got to be honest. At this point, I'm just kind of a deist. So a deist is someone who believes that God set the world in motion, that there is a God unequivocally, and that God is there and God created, but that once God created, he stepped back and said, you're on your own. He went on to say that I believe that God loves me and I believe that God created me and I don't think God has anything to do with this situation because I'm on my own at this point. And even though he said it out loud, he represents more of what I've seen over my 25 years of ministry. When we can't balance when we can't account for, when we can't understand chaos, when we can't understand trauma or grief or pain or what's going on in our lives, very rarely do we just turn away from God completely. We instead just develop a theology that says, God's not here right now. This is between us. We have to work this out. I have to do this. I have to get to the point where I can fix this. But God doesn't really have a part to play in this right now. All because we're afraid of the tension that happens when we can't explain something that we're experiencing. Interesting thing about tension, if I showed you any of the classic works of art, if I played a video of a ballet dancer dancing incredibly well towards ballet, you would see muscles in tension. Muscles that have to both pull and push at the same time. If I were to show you, if I were to bring up here someone to play the violin for you and to play one of Beethoven's sonnets, and they played it beautifully, you would see strings that are held in tension that in order to make notes have to be played in tension. And yet we get in tension in our faith, and all of a sudden we like to blame God, we like to blame others, and we like to step away. We don't want that tension. If I showed you a classic work of the Renaissance, a painting, you would see an artist trying to balance both the reality of life and the beauty of life, and you would see a tension. But something happens to us, and we don't like that tension. You know, what's interesting is Sigmund Freud said that there were two main things that people want out of life. They want work and they want love. That's what Freud said. Viktor Frankl, in his book about the Holocaust and his experience of being in a concentration camp, um, when he was saying man's search for meaning comes from man's search from the ability to have something to do and someone to love. Just as Freud said, we want work and we want love. But there's where the tension lies. Because in both of those things, in work and in love, there's something we're terrified of. Suffering. Truth be told, we don't want to suffer. We want everything to go really well. And when things don't go really well, it feels like an intrusion. It feels like something's broken. And we start asking ourselves questions. Am I broken? Is my relationship with God broken? Or is simply God himself broken? Which is really interesting to me. Because if you notice the crucifixes we wear around our necks, if you pay attention to the redemption story, we celebrate brokenness while trying to avoid it personally. We put crosses on and celebrate the brokenness of Jesus while trying to do everything in our power to make sure we have a comfortable life. You often hear this in how we talk about our children or how we talk about those around us. I just don't want them to be hurt. I just want them to have a good experience. I just don't want to see them in pain all while wearing crosses and going to church and celebrating the brokenness of a Savior. It's kind of odd, isn't it? The other thing that's really interesting to me is, is as I learned in my life to grieve and what grief was, I realized there's lots of scriptures that actually talk about it. And there's lots of places in the Bible where God's trying to show me how to grieve 
books like Levitic, or books like Lamentations, whole books about grief and how to do it. I read the Psalms and I find grief. If you were here during Bible class, you saw that um, I was an on-site counselor at Columbine, and I carried a lot of grief from my traumatic experiences from that. But it was after that experience that I learned that the Psalms were filled and deep and rich and talked about my grief openly. I also noticed scriptures about Jesus talking about grief openly. All of a sudden, scriptures like, Consider it pure joy, my friends, when you face trials of many kinds. Ooh, that feels different. My grace is sufficient for you. Ooh. These light and troubling circumstances. Ah. The Bible actually has much more to say about my grief and my trauma than I ever realized. But the use, I mean, the reality of it is, is we often don't have use for those verses. We don't want to hear about them. They don't feel good reading them at Easter Sunday. So we just kind of ignore them. The other thing that's really interesting is, is the world's view of grief. The world's view of suffering. The world's view of what it's supposed to do. The world will say things like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. The world will say things like, well, sometimes you just got to learn the hard way. The world wants to equate suffering with wisdom. The world wants to sell this vision that the older we get, the wiser we get. Let me ask you a question. Since World War II, we've been the most medicated, the most violent, and the most grief-filled society in several thousand years. Are we more wise than we were a hundred years ago? If suffering equaled wisdom, wouldn't we have caught on by now? So there lies a choice. Once we realize that we are a society that deals with suffering and grief with gloves, that we want to wash it off, we want to sanitize anything that it hurts, we want to get away from any tough experiences. When we realize that, now we're faced with a choice. And this choice, I believe, is an essential question for all of us to ask ourselves. And I want you to ask yourself this question this morning. Do you fear God or love God? Do you approach God in fear or do you approach God in love? Because that question will dictate the rest of your outlook. Because if we come to God in fear then God is a God of destruction. God is a God of control. God is a tyrant bent on just ruining everything. If we approach God out of love, then God is a God of freedom and mercy, looking to make all things new, looking to create in us something new, looking to build a new kingdom on heaven as it is in earth. You see, because I've come to understand over the past few years that God's pain, or how God views pain, is much different than how I view pain. You see, ours is to try to avoid pain or suffering or grief or anything that hurts or is uncomfortable. We want to avoid it. We want to mitigate it. We want to get rid of it. What I've noticed about how God views it is God wants to make all things new. God wants to create all things God wants to make sure that we are in relationship with him. But you're probably saying, but wait a second, Paul. If that's the case, then does God cause pain? No, God does not cause pain. But let me be clear. God will allow it. The Bible is very clear that God does not cause pain and destruction and sin. But God will use it. God will allow pain to happen sometimes. The interesting thing about my walk is that what I've noticed is I always want answers from God. I want to know why. I want to know how. I want to know when. And every time I pray those prayers, I've discovered that what God's actually interested in is my attitude. I often will say, God, why? And God will often turn that to me and say, why does it matter? I often will say, I want an answer. And God will say, why do you want control? 
I'll say, I want to know, and God will say, why don't you believe? You see, we want answers. But God wants to address our faulty thinking. Just look at scriptures and look at Jesus' responses. Jesus very rarely gave answers. And he quite often tried to address our faulty thinking and what was at the core of it. So sometimes that means God either feels very soft or very hard. And depending on your theology, we can usually get verses to support either one. Either God feels too soft, like he's hiding from us, like we can't really grasp or understand God, or God feels too hard, like he's just mean, and he's trying to crush us. Perhaps an easier way to say it is to say this, either we get crushed by God, or we throw ourselves against God until we are crushed. And you would say, that's a hard teaching. And I'd remind you of Matthew 21, 44. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken. Anyone this stone falls on will be crushed. You see, we think in absolutes. We want to think as God as a rock or an absent parent. And we don't want anything in between. Either God is a rock and he's immovable and he can't be moved and God is God and God can't change anything. Or God's just an absentee parent. He's just taking a vacation when people get cancer. He just conveniently was out of the office when churches started fighting and splitting. When your divorce happened, he just was busy. Or God's a tyrant and a control freak. We try to put God in either one of those things. And I believe that God is immovable. I believe that God is a rock that doesn't move, but not in the way you think. I believe that God is immovable in his love for us. I believe that God is immovable in his grace for us and how God wants to have a relationship with us. I believe that God's immovability is for us, not against us. So again, the easiest question to answer when we start to suffer is, where is God? That's the easiest question to ask, and I believe it's the easiest question to answer, and I'll answer it right now. If you've ever asked yourself, where is God in my pain? Where is God when I suffer? Where is God when bad things happen? When I turn on the news and children are being murdered and schools are being shot up and people are being injured, where is God when I do these things? On a cross. God is on a cross. The, the presence of suffering in the story of redemption should show us the importance of it. Think about it for a second. The Trinity of God, God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, experienced suffering, and that suffering was vital to our redemption. Why are we terrified of it? If it plays such a part in the absolute person of God, wouldn't it stand to reason that it plays a part in making us right and helping us grow closer to God? This is a hard teaching, but let me explain it. Pain and grief and suffering, what we call chaos, plays a part in life because it played a part in redemption. You see, suffering is not an experience as much as it can be an invitation. Again, God doesn't cause suffering, but God wants to use it desperately. If we start to view pain and suffering more as childbirth, starting a process in us and not as a one-time event that happened i spent eight weeks in bed i spent all this time in the hospital 
if I start to talk differently about it and instead say, let me tell you what God's been doing in my life this year, then a different process has started. And you may say, Paul, this is a hard teaching. Let me give you some verses. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those that love God. All things work together for good for those that love God. Remember what we said, great art requires great tension. In order for us to exist, it isn't just do we experience order or do we experience chaos, it's how do we experience these things in tension. And once these things are in tension, how do we make music? How do we recognize God? The interesting thing to, for me is the fact that we actually have a word for this in Christian circles. We have a word for explaining this tension. We have a word for explaining how suffering plays a role in our life. We call it testimony. Testimony is the process of explaining how God has used the tension of your life between the order of your life and the chaos of your life. What has happened and what God wants to do with it. We call that testimony. We celebrate testimony all while trying to avoid any experiences that deepen our testimony. Now, does that mean we're trying to go out and find suffering? No, it doesn't. It simply means that when life comes, and all of us have had life come, all of us have had something happen that gives us grief, that gives us bad experiences in our life. It simply means that when we do that, we surrender those over to God. And all of a sudden, it's not me against God, it's me participating with God. It's me joining God in the work of redemption. It's me saying, Jesus is on a cross, and I am joining Jesus in that work of redemption. It means that now I'm a free subject. It means that now I'm not some controlled robot that just experiences whatever God has in store from me. It means that I have the freedom to choose, will I follow God or will I not? Ultimately, that's the only choice I have. I don't get to choose who lives in my life. I don't get to choose who dies in my life. Really interesting story about this trauma. I've been told since the beginning, since day one, since I showed up at the hospital, my trauma surgeon just said, I need to tell you a few things. And I said, okay, and you, naively, okay, what do you need to tell me? And he said, you have a crushing chest wound. He said, there's an 80% chance that you will be on uh, painkillers till the day you die. Oh, is there any good news? He goes, yeah, there's about a 90% chance you're going to be in chronic pain till the day you die. I said, oh, great, what else? And he said, you're going to have a flailed chest, which means as you get older, you're going to be more susceptible to respiratory illnesses. And even though we don't really know how it's going to play out, there's a great possibility that this injury you, that you just survived might kill you just in 30 years. And I only have one thing. Choice. The past couple of months as I've started going back to church, I've had friends ask me, how are you doing? How are things? And I'm, I'm doing really well. Um, and, and one of the things that asked me the other day is a friend of mine came up to me and said, uh, I, I heard you say you're going back and forth to these doctors in another town. I, I, I've kept my treatment in Santa Fe, not where I live now in Texas. And I said, yes, I, I am. I'm looking at several other surgeries. I'm looking at several procedures. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm facing several things. And he goes, why are you doing that? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, like you look healthy. Why are you doing that? And I said, because there's a risk that I'm going to be in chronic pain the rest of my life. And he goes, no, that won't happen. You just got to be positive. Oh, that's how it works. <laughs> Here's the reality. I, I, I was telling Kyle this. The reality is I do understand that my attitude deeply plays into how I feel. And my attitude cannot change one single plate in my body or how it feels to have it there. The only thing I have is choice. I choose to give these experiences to God. I want to read another interesting verse, if you haven't ever seen this. This is out of Isaiah, chapter 53. It's one of those verses we conveniently forget about. Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. This, of course, is the prophet Isaiah speaking about Christ's role that will happen in a thousand years. Isaiah was the prophet that really got the most things right. 
He was the prophet that was telling the people after they returned from Babylon exactly what this Christ, this Messiah would be. And he says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And you go, I've heard all this. I know all this. What about this last verse? And by his wounds we are healed. Some of the older versions of the Bible say, by his stripes we are saved. I recently ran into a friend of mine at church whose wife had cancer. And I saw her walk across and I said, your wife's here today. She hasn't been in church in about eight weeks. And he goes, yes, it is. And I said, how are you? And he didn't miss a beat. He said, by his stripes we are saved. I'll give you one more in case you're not convinced. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. If we suffer with Him, we will also be raised with Him. Notice it doesn't say if everything goes right. It doesn't say if things go well. If you're a good planner, if you're a good saver, if you're great at relationships, if you know how to pray really well, it says if we suffer with Him. Not perfection, not order, suffer. So here's the question. Does God cause bad things to happen? No. But God wants to use them. And it simply requires you to surrender. Surrender your ideas. Surrender your desires. Surrender. It's something we don't talk enough about sometimes. I can't control who lives and who dies in your life. Neither can you. I can't control what relationships go well and what relationships break. I can't control what you see. I can't control what you experience. I can't control who hurts you. I can't control how other people's sin will affect you. And neither can you. But you have one thing that always remains in your control. Choice. Will you give it to God and trust? Will you trust that even though you cannot see a future... Now that this has happened, there will be one. Will you trust that even though you cannot see how things will play out, that God will be there as they play out? As you experience the realities of whatever grief you're going through, do you trust that God will use that for something else? And let me be clear here, it's not pay to play. It's not causation. It's not if you do this, you're going to get this. It's not, uh, I had to deal with this grief and now God's going to give me that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is having a loving relationship with the Savior. Getting to a point where you say, I can't control God, but I can live in the experience of God. I can dwell in the house of God. I can be in community with other people. We want to control. We want order. I don't know how God will work. But I know God will work. If you've read some of the Old Testament, you've seen that Job and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and others are advocates of this philosophy. My favorite line from Job is Job says, Though he slay me, I worship him. Sometimes this is called even if faith. Even if I don't get what I want, I'm still going to believe that God loves me and God wants something good for me. You see, because here's what I've learned about chaos and order coexisting in life. And I'm going to read what I wrote in my journal because I don't want to screw it up. I wrote this, I believe, for my hospital bed.
Without my grief and trauma, I cannot know the depths of joy. And without joy and the blessings that God has given me, I cannot survive the depths of my grief. You see, chaos and order can not only exist in our life as spiritual beings, I think they should. I am a broken man, and I could not be more excited about what God's going to do from that. I invite you today to ask yourself that same question. Do I love God or do I fear God? Because if I fear God, life's pretty hard. If I love God, I now have the choice to surrender my experiences and trust that God will use them and trust that God is active and trust that God wants to see God's kingdom and my life flourish. I'd like to pray for you now. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you that for over a century, you've used this church in this community. I thank you for the active ways you are currently using this church, whether it be through outreach or working with other people or just simply through the daily lives of everyone here. I thank you for what you're doing in this church. And I know it's been a hard year, but I also know that you were good. I also know that your spirit never sleeps. And I ask that right now you help everyone in this church Feel your presence and surrender to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.